All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Last week we did our introductory message, and then this week we're going to get started on 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, more than thankful. So in his book, Folk Psalms of Faith, Ray Stedman tells of an experience, H.A. Ironside. Has anybody ever heard of Ironside? Old, old commentator. He's really, really good. Uh, this guy tells of an experience Ironside had in a crowded restaurant. Just as Ironside was about to begin his meal, a man approached and asked if he could join him. Ironside invited him to have a seat. Then, as was his custom, Ironside bowed his head in prayer. When he opened his eyes, the other man asked, do, do you have a headache? Ironside replied, no, I don't. The other man said, well, is there something wrong with your food? Ironside replied, no, I'm simply thanking God as I always do before I eat. The man said, oh, you're one of those, are you? Well, I want you to know that I never give thanks. I earn my money by the sweat of my brow, and I don't have to give thanks to anybody when I eat. I just start right in. Ironside says, yes, you're just like my dog. That's what he does, too. <laughs> yes, that was good. How thankful are you? We're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to learn about being thankful. So let's read this chapter. Ten verses, it'll go quick. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sakes. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord is sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come today God wants you to see why Paul is so thankful for the church at Thessalonica Paul gives three reasons here why he is so thankful for the church at Thessalonica and guys here's my one of my challenges for you this morning as you think about our church here, Carlton Brethren Church, I want to challenge you guys. What are three reasons that you love our church? The people, the people, the people, the people, the people and the people. There's a lot of reasons that we can be thankful for our church. I could probably do a whole sermon on why I am thankful for all of you guys. And why I'm thankful for our church. And there's all different kinds of things going on there. But I suspect that my list and my sermon would be different from yours. So I want to challenge you guys. As we think about how Paul is thankful for the church at Thessalonica, how are you thankful for our church? Paul gives three reasons here as to why he's so thankful for the church at Thessalonica. Verses 1 through 5, the first reason, he's thankful for their salvation. He's thankful for their salvation. Second reason, verses 6 and 7, he's thankful for their support. He's thankful for their support. And then in verses 8 through 10, he's thankful for their service. He's thankful for their service. So he's thankful for their salvation, their support, and their service. So, 
Let's start to look at this. These first five verses, he's thankful for their salvation. What does he talk about when he's talking about their salvation? So Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father, the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very common, normal, standard, regular, expected introduction to a typical greeting or letter that Paul would typically send. So there's nothing really fancy about that. Sometimes he gets a little irritated, like in Galatians. Remember when we studied Galatians? This is not how we started Galatians. You remember that? He was fired up in Galatians. This is a normal introduction. Galatians, he was he was gonna he was having it with them. But Paul is in a different mindset. Remember, as he started this church in Thessalonica, I put on Facebook, uh, what was it, a couple of days ago, Acts chapter 17. Do you remember how many weeks Paul spent with the Thessalonians there before he got driven out? Three weeks. Very good. Three weeks he spent with the Thessalonians. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as kind of like on a back burner of your mind. Three weeks. How long have you guys been believers? Anywhere from 30 years or more for some of you. Mine is, uh, I just turned 18 in the Lord. So some of you have been Christians your entire life. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. Paul spent, some people think maybe three months. Let's, even if we said three months, three weeks, short time, think about all of the theology, all of the deep truths of the Christian faith that Paul talks about here in Thessalonians. And we talked about this last week in the introductory message, all the theology that Paul spends talking with these guys here. After three weeks, remember, before those three weeks, there was nothing. Do you remember what it was like before you came to Christ? I do. I didn't know the difference between Moses and Jesus. I didn't know there was a difference between an Old and a New Testament. I didn't know about any of the miracles of the Bible. I didn't know that Jesus was raised from the dead. I didn't know there was a thing that was called sin. I didn't know who Adam was. Nothing, ladies and gentlemen. I was as clean of a slate as it gets. These Thessalonians were much like that. They had no Christian background, nothing. There may have been some Jews in a synagogue, but they didn't know who Jesus was. They certainly had no clue who Paul was. Paul shows up, three weeks later leaves, and in those three weeks he establishes this church, he establishes his believers, and we're going to talk about some really deep theological truths that so many of us over 30 years talk very little about. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. He says in verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing. So he's, this is what he's thankful for. This is what he's praying about. Your work of faith your labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. How many of you could I say that about? Nobody? Certainly there's somebody here who has a work of faith, a labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Certainly there's one of you here. Thank you, Mary. There's one. I would like to think that all of you are like this before God the Father as you go through Walmart, as you're driving and you get cut off. And that's kind of cheap, isn't it? We don't really act like Christians when we get cut off, do we? Do you? Honestly? Come on. How much of your Christian life is demonstrated by these characteristics? If I found you out in Walmart and I didn't know who you were and you didn't know who I was, what do you think I would think of you? If we were out driving, if we were at a restaurant and I didn't know who you were and you didn't know who I was, what do you think I would think of you? I don't think it's me you should be worried about. We have these these moments in our life where we have an opportunity to show the love of God and Jesus Christ to people. And I fear that we do not take advantage of them nearly as often as we could or as we should. 
And Paul is thankful for the salvation of these Thessalonians because in those moments, they are showing and demonstrating their love for God and Jesus all the time. He says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, he knows that they are saved. Now, how many of you are ready for the election talk? Nobody? These? Remember, three weeks, three weeks he spent with them, and he's already talking to them about election, like they know what he's talking about. We've been believers for 30 plus years, and old oh, pastor, don't talk about election. Are you ready? <laughs> what is election? How did Paul know that they were like, wouldn't it be great if as you're walking through your world, there was like a stripe down people's backs and whoever had the stripe was elect and whoever did not have the stripe was not elect. You'd know who to witness to. You'd know who the believers were. You'd have all this information. Wouldn't it be great? I would love that. But you know what the truth is? I don't have a stripe down my back and neither do you and I'm not getting one either because it doesn't exist. How in the world can Paul make such a bold claim that he knew that they were elect? And what does it mean to be elect? The, the Bible talks a lot about election. The Bible talks about election in Ephesians, in 1 Peter, here in Thessalonians, and in many other places. The Bible doesn't shy away from the idea and doctrine of election. Election is the idea that God has elected certain people to receive salvation. And we don't like that idea. We just don't like it. But it's in there, so we need to talk about it. Now, why did God choose some people and not others? Why did God choose me and not my brother? I don't know. Why, why does he make any of these decisions? And how do I know any of these things? And how do you know that I'm elect? And there's so many questions. The one, there's two ways that you know if somebody's elect. You ready? You ready? Get your pens ready to go. Some deep black magic here. I don't know. Two ways you know if somebody's elect. Number one. If they have called on the name of the Lord for salvation, if they are saved, if, they, you know, if they're believers, they must be elect. If they die without Christ, they must not have been elect. Everybody else I don't know, and neither do you. And Paul could see the salvation inherent in these Thessalonians. And so when he looked at them and he saw what was going on in their lives and he knew that they were believers, he knew that they were elect. It's just that easy. And he doesn't shy away from using this term either. Now, why did God choose some and not others? Why didn't he just choose everybody? Wouldn't it have been a lot easier if he had just chosen everybody? But he didn't. I think one of the one of the keys that we have to understand when we think about election is that, here's my question for you, did God have to choose or elect anybody? He did not have to choose any one of us. He could have chosen to not elect anybody. And would he have been wrong if he'd have made that choice? He would not have been wrong. The fact that he chose even one of us on this whole planet over the last how many thousands of years the fact that he chose even one person shows the grace of an almighty God who is willing to forgive. But he didn't just choose one. He hasn't just chosen two or three hundred thousand of us. He's chosen a great multitude of us for election, for salvation, to be forgiven I hope you're one of them. We do have that choice. We're not going to go that deep, Eleanor. <laughs> That's pretty deep. That's the 10 foot pool. We're just kind of wading into like the five foot. Like I want the water up to like here. Where I can still walk and be comfortable, but not feel like I'm drowning. <laughs> but we can do that, and that would be fun. 
So he knows their salvation and he's thankful for it. So one of the things that I could say that I'm thankful for for you guys is your salvation. That's a wonderful thing to be thankful for. Are you thankful for your salvation? Paul is very concerned about their salvation. He's very thankful for it. And as he goes on here, he says, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So when this gospel was brought in, not that long ago, because remember, he was only there for like three weeks, remember that. When the gospel came in, there was tremendous power. As you read through the book of Acts, everywhere that Paul went, there was some sort of calamity. There was some sort of issue, an earthquake in the Philippian jail. Remember that? He was in Ephesus and they chased him out. Remember that? He was stoned. Remember that? All, everywhere Paul went, there was some sort of problem. Why was he only in Thessalonica for three weeks? Because he was chased out. He went to somewhere else. He says, when the gospel comes, there's much power. The Holy Spirit is there. Things happen. So guys, when the Holy Spirit is here and he's powerful and he moves and there's some energy there, I trust that you feel that and are ready for that when you come to church, when you're worshiping by yourself in your room or wherever you like to worship. Maybe it's at the break table at work, right, Jeff? Right. You and me both. It doesn't matter where you're at. You can honor God with your time, whether you're at work. You can honor God with your time if you're brushing your teeth. You can honor God with your time if you're driving. You can honor God and have the power of God in your life. The Holy Spirit can be in control of your life every minute of every day. If you want. Are you praying for that? Are you looking for that? Or are you satisfied with a mostly burned out torch? This is what we talked about in Sunday school as we are studying the book of Revelation. We talked about the idea of our torches being lit and being on fire for God and, and having that passion for him and, and wanting to serve him and going out and doing stuff and being, being that lighthouse for him. But how many of us aren't a lighthouse? How many of us have a flickering candle at best? I trust that we all have this powerful lighthouse of a beam of light that just shines in the darkness in this dead and dying world that we live in. Although I do recognize that sometimes we can be little candles. And Paul says, when the gospel came to you guys at Thessalonica, there was a lot of power there. We changed the world. We turned it upside down. The Holy Spirit was there and things were rocking. And I trust in your Christian life, the Holy Spirit is powerful in your life and rocking as well. It's the evidence of salvation in your life when your life is rocking for God like that. That's fantastic. And he's so thankful for their salvation. But that's not the only reason that he's thankful for them. As we see why Paul is thankful for the church at Thessalonica, the first reason is because of their salvation. The second reason is because of their support in verses 6 and 7. And you became followers of us. Isn't it great that when you're doing something in life, when you have somebody come alongside of you to cheer you on, to spend time with you, to, to listen to you, doesn't it just make you feel so much better? I'll give you an example. I've got a friend of mine. His name is Nathan. I've loved Nathan for, for years and years and years. I first met him at Fairway. This is my Fairway story, Eleanor. So... I met Nathan years and years ago, um, and, and as I talked to him, he has to remind me of stories, because I don't remember when I first met him. He's like, you don't remember training me? <laughs> no. But, so I've known him for a long, long time, and he's been with Fairway for a while. He's, he just, a couple years ago, quit Fairway, and, and uh, he's, he's really into fitness. He's got a dietitian degree from um, Iowa State, and uh, he's doing really great, and he wants to uh, develop more into like personal training and, 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 and dietitian work. So he started his Instagram account, and he's really wanting to do some stuff with that and you know, build, a, build a brand and build a business and you know, do something with his life. And I'm really happy for him. And you know what I told him? You're on your own, sucker. <laughs> what do you think I said to him? I said, I'm going to be the first one that likes your stuff. 
I'm going to be the first one that shares it. I'm going to comment on it. I believe in you. I think you can do it. I'm going to be right there all the way. You can ask me questions. I'll put stuff on there. And he had a thing on there, asked me questions. I submitted a question to him, and he had to make a video about it and answer that. I support him. I'm following him. I am in it with him. I believe in him because I love him. Do you guys love Jesus? Do you follow him? Are you doing what he asks you to do? Are you liking his stuff? Are you commenting on his stuff? Are you, are you reading his stuff? How many of us, oh, I love Jesus. When's the last time you read the Bible? What Bible? I'd have to dust it off first. How would my friend feel if I said, oh, I'm going to like all your stuff. I really appreciate you. And then I, oh, what did you think of my last post? What post? You'd probably feel kind of heartbroken. <clears throat> Jesus, I love you to pieces, but I, well, I haven't been to church in six months. I haven't prayed in a year. I've got to dust my Bible off to read it. But I love you, Jesus. Oh, I'm going to follow you. What? <laughs> uh, hello? Like, wow. Paul is thankful for their support. They support him. He says, you became followers of us. When, when Paul came and presented the gospel to these people, three weeks time, it exploded. They turned that town upside down. The message of the gospel was powerful. The Holy Spirit was there. Things happened. They started to follow him and the message that he was preaching. And he's thankful for that. And I'm thankful for you guys. I try to preach this message just as faithfully as Paul would. I try my hardest to preach this thing as absolutely faithfully as I can. And I am very thankful that you guys are here and that you support me. Mary, you're, you tell me every, almost every Monday you're praying for me. I can't even, you have no idea what that means to me. I don't even think I can explain it without tears coming out of my eyes. How thankful I am for that. And this is what Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica. You became followers of us. And he's so thankful and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. You know, what is he saying here? He's saying it might not have been easy for all of you guys to believe this. It might not have been a walk in the park. You know, let me tell you something you guys might not know. Life's not all sunshine and rainbows. How many of you already knew that? It's not all sunshine and rainbows. The day you accept Jesus was going to be a great day, but that doesn't mean your life gets easier. For many of us, when we accept Jesus, our life gets harder. And this is what Paul is saying. You followed us. You became followers of us and of the Lord, even though it was tough. Even though there are days when you don't want to get up to follow us, you got up. There are days where you don't want to do this and you don't want to do that. You got up and you're following us in spite of the affliction, in spite of the whatever's going on in your life. You're following us. The joy of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, getting up out of bed and doing what we're supposed to do, reading our Bible. Sometimes... May I say it this way? It's not necessarily the joy of reading the Bible. The, the Holy Spirit is what's going to bring you the joy. It's the it's the being obedient to the Holy Spirit that's going to bring you joy. He's going to use the vehicle of the Word of God to do that. But it's the Holy Spirit, guys. Make no mistake, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to bring joy into your life as a result of your obedience to Him. Remember, as we went through Philippians... I don't know, I think if I said it one time, I said it a hundred times. Joy is the byproduct of obedience. We don't go looking for joy in life. We need to be looking for obedience, and the joy will come as a byproduct. And he says, with joy of the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that brought you joy. So much so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Guys, this is so great that your faith, your witness, what you did as followers of us, as people that are saved, followers, elect of God, who became followers of us, that example 
went out to many other people. Maybe there's a little bit of me that wonders if Paul is saying, oh no, I don't even have to go to Macedonia and okay, you guys are doing the job for me. That's fantastic. Because you know what, guys? Let me tell you guys something. You have areas of opportunity and ministry, whether it's in your families, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, etc. You have areas and opportunities of ministry that I will never, ever have. Ever. And I have opportunities in areas of ministry that you guys may not ever have either. There's a possibility that you guys will never step foot in the Huxley Fairway. Strong possibility. I go there almost every single day. So I have plenty of opportunity there. I might not ever step foot into Lennox, Jeff. But you do almost every single day. And your faith, your witness can reach out there so that I don't even need to say anything at Lennox. Isn't that awesome? Where can you go that I don't even need to say anything? Because you're such an awesome witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel that I don't even need to go there. Because you're doing it. What a concept. That's fantastic. Paul is so thankful for their support that they're willing to go and be examples everywhere that he cannot go. He cannot be everywhere all at one time. So he's so thankful for their salvation. He's so thankful for their support. He's also thankful for their service. Verse 8, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. Guys, let's not limit it. Let's not limit God to where you can go, to where I can go, to where the gospel can go. We can go every place. We were just saying before we started service today how, how these sermons have gone out into how many different countries around the world I don't know about you, but I really don't want to limit God to where he can take the gospel, to where Jesus can be, to what can happen if we just sound the word out and just let it go. Martin Luther said that the Bible is like a caged lion. All you got to do is let it out. It'll, 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 it'll work. <laughs> Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what matter of entry we had to you and how you turned from God or turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So in those three short weeks, they went from having no real basis of foundation of religion or anything. And in three weeks, God completely transformed that city. As you remember reading in Acts chapter 17, it says, how many people believed? Did anybody read that? How many? Like 10? How many believed? You remember what it said? And a great multitude believed. Now, I don't know how many a great multitude is in the city of 200,000, but I suspect it's probably a great multitude. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but it's probably a great multitude. It's a lot of people in the city of 200,000. Their witness went out, it sounded forth, and they went from having nothing, no concept of these things. They were serving idols, more than likely most of them, to serving the true and living God. Their faith went out. They have this salvation. They're supporting Paul now after those three short weeks. They have this level of service that is so commendable that has gone out to all these different areas of the world. They've stopped serving idols. They started serving God. And he's so thankful for their service to God and whatever that means. For each and every single one of us, we have a different way and opportunity to serve God. The things that I can do are unique and special to me, and that's great. And there's things that are unique and special to you as well. Every one of you has been gifted by God somehow in some way with some sort of skill or talent or something, some gift somewhere that you can serve God with. The question isn't, do you have one? The question is, what are you doing with it? How are you serving God? Paul was thankful for their service to God because these guys just didn't go to church and then they went home. How is their example going forth to Macedonia, to Achaia, and to all around if they just go to church and go home? 
They must be out in the community. They must be going somewhere. They must be talking to somebody. Remember, now this may throw you guys for a bit of a loop. Put your buckles on, you know, five-point harness. Are you ready for this? Back in A.D., like 50, when this was written, there was no Facebook. <laughs> How in the world did these guys transmit messages without Facebook? How did they do it? They must have used Twitter. <laughs> Twitter and Instagram were your answers. They did, how did they do it? They didn't just read the Bible at home and never talk about it ever again. There's no Walmarts back then either, by the way. No cars. Nothing. No telephones. This thing on, there's no telephones either. Nothing, no Morse code, nothing, no trains, no airplanes. How do you get this message to go and so that it sounds forth to everywhere without transportation, internet, Facebook? How do you do that? But what we do know is that they did. It went everywhere. This flame was so far spread, you couldn't stop it if you wanted to. This is what happens when you have people who are genuinely saved, who are genuinely supporting the Apostle Paul, who are genuinely serving their God. The word of the Lord cannot be stopped. It will maintain its course, and the gates of hell, anybody? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You cannot stop what God has started with this gospel. It is so incredibly powerful. The Holy Spirit has made it so incredibly powerful. The death of Jesus is so amazing that when you start telling people about it, it cannot be stopped. Do you believe that? Who's the last person you told the gospel to? If you want to sit there and tell me that you June go preacher man, well, how many people did you share the gospel with this week? Well, zero. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, get out there. Serve the Lord. I'm thankful for your salvation. Paul's thankful for their salvation, their support, their service. And he goes on to say, and this is one of the most interesting parts to me, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from that, and even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Three weeks time, guys, they already knew about the wrath to come. They knew about Jesus coming back, the return of Jesus. They understood eschatology, at least on some level here. And as we continue on in the book of 1 Thessalonians, he gets more and more and more and more and more and deeper and deeper and deeper into the idea of the return of Jesus. Three weeks, guys, and they were tracking him. Three weeks, they were tracking him. Guys, he's so thankful for their service here. And this is really what motivates them as they wait for Jesus from heaven, whom God raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Is this your bedrock confidence that you bank everything else on? As you think about being thankful this is what I said last week in the message. What are you most thankful for? While I'm very thankful for your salvation and your support and your service, and Paul was so thankful for those things as well, my challenge to you is this. The thing that I am most thankful for in the midst of all of this stuff, the thing that I am the most thankful for is this in verse 10, that Jesus died for me, that he came to this earth he suffered on the cross. He had that cruel, cruel death on the cross. And it was my sins that hung him there. And it was your sins that hung him there. And he willingly took that. He was obedient to the point of the death on the cross. As he paid for your sins and mine, as he hung on that tree and gave up his last breath, he was buried and God rose him three days later rose him from the dead in glorious resurrection power. As a result of his death, I can be forgiven. I can call on the name of the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me, a wretched sinner, and I can be forgiven. That is what I am most thankful for. 
Jesus has delivered me from the wrath that is to come. Because if I would not have called on the name of the Lord to forgive me, my eternal destiny would be in a real place called hell. This is the punishment for all of those who fail to neglect or who fail to acknowledge Jesus as their Savior and have their sins forgiven. I talked to Julie last week about what this idea of salvation means, soteria. She was asking me about what that word was last week. Soteria means to be redeemed or rescued or saved or delivered. And this is what Jesus does for us. He delivers us from that wrath to come that we're on such a track towards. And so I thank God for all of these things. I want to close with this last poem, if you will. Today upon a bus, I saw a lovely maid with golden hair. I envied her. She seemed so happy and how I wished I were so fair. When suddenly she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. She had one foot and wore a crutch, but as she passed, a smile. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two feet. The world is mine. And when I stopped to buy some sweets, the lad who served me had such charm. He seemed to radiate good cheer. His manner was so kind and warm. I said, it's nice to deal with you. Such courtesy I seldom find. He turned and said, oh, thank you, sir. And then I saw that he was blind. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. Then when walking down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue. He stood and watched the others play. It seemed he knew not what to do. I stopped a moment, then I said, why don't you join in the others, dear? He looked ahead without a word, and then I knew he couldn't hear. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two ears, the world is mine. With feet to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunset glow, with ears to hear what I would know, I am blessed indeed. The world is mine. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. What are you thankful for? Let's pray.